lahat at magandang umaga mula dito sa Cambridge. Um, okay. So, before I start, gusto ko pong i-introduce kung saan kami nagtatrabaho. <laughs> so, ito pong, the picture here in front is the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. So, I work in the Division of Virology, which is inside the Addenbrooke's Hospital, which is the university hospital within uh, the Biomedical Campus. So surrounding this hospital uh, and where we collaborate with other scientists, especially now during the pandemic, are the Cancer Research UK, AstraZeneca, Upcom, and a hospital component who studies heart and brain surgery, and all the other funding bodies. I show this because I thought it is uh, one of the visions of the Philippine Virology Center to, I mean, one of my uh, ambitious vision as well, to be able to see a similar infrastructure in our country. So I would like to say thank you again to everybody. And I am genuinely grateful for all of you for taking part in this lecture series. I definitely hope that you are learning and I hope you will be able to put all of this knowledge into application. So actually what I did yesterday was to take the questions that was received and I thought I will have a few uh, minutes to actually go through some of them, especially those that I think are very important highlight of uh, the topic. This will also give us a good recap of what we have uh, learned yesterday. So the first question is, oh, those are highlighted in yellow, okay? Uh, there are, are there special regulations for humanized animal models such as animals or such as mice with artificially implanted uh, immune system or organs from humans? So this project which involves the use of animals containing human material, they definitely raise uh, ethical issues and societal concerns. And so when it is part of a restricted uh, work in um, regulated procedures, however, if it's uh, inevitable to do the project, it will require another additional legislation and may, for example, come from Human Fertilization or Embryology Act. And I also would like to stress that sometimes there will be some uh, very complex project that will need uh, further reviews. And I think in the UK and maybe around the world, there will be a case-to-case -case basis discussions. Next question is, what is meant by rehoming and what animals can be rehomed? What, how animals can be rehomed not to pose public health? I have briefly answered this, but I think I just wanted to stress that rehoming is either proposed or it is proposed and indicated when an animal, the, uh, the, state, the general health state of an animal is good and that is not posing any danger to the public. And also any animals that was used in the lab for research, before they go back to the wild, for example, they will undergo rehabilitation training programs. For the animals, such as uh, domestic animals, before uh, they go back to, uh, before they get rehomed, they will undergo what they call socialization training programs. And these two schemes are very important to ensure that the animals are being set free and the rehoming will, uh, and then after they are rehomed, they will be able to adapt to the new environment. Um, the next one is, 
in the use of animals in secondary education, is frog okay to be used by science teachers or is there a need to obtain a license? Uh, this is a little bit funny for me because when I was a university student in UPLB, you can easily just take uh, frogs from the pond. But actually, uh, recently it has been found uh, in the UK that frogs and even the common frogs, and that includes the common frogs, are getting extinct. And also there are groups in the Philippines that have been trying to raise to conserve uh, the species of frog. And so right now in, in Britain, frog is classified as a protected animal. Therefore, uh, when you dissect or do any regulated procedures to frog, it will require application for license. However, in the Philippines, it has not yet been um, uh, implemented. I think there are calls to do that. Uh, next, due to the advent of technology, some animal handling procedures may have changed. And Christine would like to add ask whether the procedures such as the tail suspension tests and four swimming tests can still be used today. So um, I would like to stress that any experiment, because of the use of animal, it already raises ethical issues. What happens is reviewers look at the validity of the test and whether the information that is gained there translates into human. And then they look at the severity of the test and its effects on the welfare of the animals involved. After that, they weigh whether the benefits gained from the test justify the harms that is caused to the animals. Actually, the forced swimming test is still classified as a moderate, under moderate severity classification. Therefore, it can be used. Um, and there are already additional steps whether the potential harm from the procedure is uh, minimized. And that includes gentle drying, warming, heated holding cages before they return to cage and cage mate. And the second to the last question is an IACU. If uh, IACU will be required if you're only using invertebrates. I have read in literature and tried to look at that yesterday. And it is said that IACU will not require an animal use protocol for activities involving lower level invertebrate species. And yeah, and then lastly, uh, someone mentioned uh, the use of LD50 or lethality dose related experiments. Um, actually, in the UK and in a lot of countries, the lethal dose test has already been banned. And I think it should be as well in, in our country, as well as the tests for cosmetics uh, and that is because there are already methods that where you can test the test and evaluate this the LD50 and uh, cosmetics when not using any animal techniques. Okay. So going back, and um, I'd like to thank the moderator for stressing this. And I am stressing again that the three R's are the integral part of the Animal Welfare Act. So R, the first R is replacement. It means the methods that avoid or replace the use of animals. And here is just an example of the use of brain organoids. It has been well used in mice nowadays. Next is reduction, which are the methods refers to methods to minimize the number of use of, the number of animals used per study while still maintaining a robust experimental design. And just, there are a lot of uh, uh, more advanced imaging techniques that allows you to look at longitudinal analysis. And in a, an example here is bioluminescent imaging. 
And lastly, it's about refinement. So these are methods that minimize pain and distress and improve animal welfare. And one of the uh, practices that is well uh, being established in lots of laboratories, environmental enrichment. So most of, of, of the topics that I will be presenting to you today is focused on refinement procedures. So the aims of the lecture is to be able to first uh, assess animal welfare and hopefully for you to learn about uh, the advances in methods for good handling and restraint skills, practices for animal transport, positive training, re positive reinforcement training, the use of rat tickling, pain assessment, euthanasia and disposal. So, okay, okay, so what are welfare assessment? So welfare assessment applies to monitoring animals with pain, suffering and distress, which are associated with the regulated procedures. But not only that, because assessing welfare also includes the routine assessment, and this is a daily assessment um, of checking the animals for any health and welfare problems. And it is because welfare assessment is also a component of the scientific method because whatever physiological and psychological response, because if uh, physiological and psychological responses are maybe related to stress or suffering, they can affect the quality of your data. So there are appropriate indicators for every species and every strain and every procedure. And this is not just done by one person, welfare assessment in an establishment, as I have said yesterday, there are at least five named persons and they're working as a team to be able to ensure that effective welfare assessment protocols are set up. So there are guidelines on selecting appropriate indicators for welfare. And there are also like a glossary of indicators that can be tailored to each individual species. But in general, there is a six level categories to, uh, that is identified as welfare indicators. First is appearance. Appearance includes body, coat and skin, condition. And for example, if the coat looks dry or in cap, or there are porphyrin staining. Next is body function. And this would um, involve the use of uh, the changes in body temperature or reduced in food intake. Third is uh, indicator is environment, especially within the enclosure. And it is also possible to have an outside uh, environment to maintain the natural behavior of your test animals. And so in environment, we look at nests quality and consistency of the animal feces. Fourth is a beha behavior, and this includes social interactions, uh, posture, gait, undesirable behavior, and, and if the animal is showing some undesirable behaviors. Next is a procedure specific indicators. An example of that is tumor size, for example, in cancer studies. And lastly is a free observations. And these are just for observers to enter their own, in their own way or tax if they have seen indicator of suffering that were not uh, predicted. So it is important to note that the assessment and report of actual severity must be done 
competently and by a qualified person. And so that's why I was uh, telling you that there are five main person and each person is well trained. Um, each person has their own specific roles. So on a daily basis, they should be able to assess whether the animals is assess the severity classification. And we studied yesterday that they are classified as non-recovery, mild, moderate, and severe. So there should be an effective record keeping and review, which is essential for a day-to-day -day welfare monitoring and a project review. And lastly, um, welfare indicators or identifying welfare indicators depends upon a team of staff who between them possess the necessary knowledge and practical skills. So every member of the staff should gain training that is tailored to every or each species project and a welfare assessment process for each individual research institutions as well. So laboratory animals are inevitably subjected to human contact. So that's why the use of appropriate and skilled handling is essential to ensure that animals readily accept or actively seek human contact so that the procedures are carried out efficiently and it is not causing any anxiety or exaggerated stress because all of the adverse uh, handling can lead can be very detrimental to animal health and it can increase difficulty of handling over time and it can even lead to defensive aggression from animals. So Whenever you approach any animal, it is important that uh, the animal is approached in a calm manner. And ha although handling method will depend on each species as well. Um, I have been saying about uh, the effect of handling that can be detrimental. And I will just be showing you here a, a study that is done by scientists where they compare the behavioral aspects when an animal is handled by a tail handling or those that are handled by tunnel or cupping methods. So the first one is an animal handled by tail. And as you can see, the mice is more cautious and did not explore normally. And they were not able to interact properly in the test environment. However, the animal that was handled by tunnel or this also applies to copying method, they're more bolder and they explore normally. And in this way, the scientists would be able to measure natural behaviors rather than interactions that are um, an effect or response to being handled. So again, you have to approach uh, the animal in a calm and confident manner. They have to uh, handled in several ways. I mean, there are the for in the case of mice, they are usually handled um, by cupping method or by tunnel handling. In the case of rodents, it is best to handle them by uh, cupping method or tunnel, but not through their tail. Uh, for non primates, and I'll be showing that later as well they do not want to be handled at all. And so it would be uh, useful if you do a 
prevent direct handling by using positive reinforcement. Restriction. So when you're trying to restrain an animal, it is important that there is a correct positioning of the handler and the animal. And it's also, uh, and that is because it is necessary to achieve a quick, secure restraint. And animals need to feel secure and they need to be completely immobile to avoid struggling. It's also important that you should have a, a grip that is just sufficient to hold it firmly and securely, but not tightly in such a way that it will cause discomfort and compromise animal breathing and cause bruising. So it is important that when we handle animals, we observe their responses. And that is because it allows the scientist or the researcher to do an immediate adjustment just for uh, animal security and safety. So acquiring good handling skills needs training in appropriate methods. And they are not just done in, uh, in one day. I'm sure everyone has to practice. I myself we have to do several trainings to be able to handle quickly and then also effectively. Um, so we should have, as a scientist, we should have skills to be that is sufficient to capture animals quickly, confidently, and securely without the need for any chasing. And lastly is on reward training. Reward training is more for the animals. So it is now encouraged that handler should try to gain voluntary cooperation from the animals to minimize any negative response to handling. A positive reinforcement uh, technique or a reward training method usually by giving food work very effectively, especially in dog and non-primates or non-human primates. So how to pick a mice? I'm just uh, showing here this through a video. So in when you're trying to pick a mice, there are two ways. It's either cupping or tunnel holding. By cupping, you simply scoop the animals onto the hand. And this works well when once a mice become habituated to being picked up. Habituation between the handler and the animal is really very important. And also cupping is usually um, recommended, especially for animals which, is, which are a little bit jumpy. So to habituate the animals, animals can be held loosely between closed hands initially or picked up by handling a tunnel. And when you're uh, picking up a, a mice using tunnel handling or holding, you first try to guide the mice into the handling tunnel and then the tunnel is lifted and transported to their destination. Once they're into their destination, you gently tip the animals from the tunnel backwards and directly into the surface or hand. It is important that you have the appropriate size of your tunnel and yeah, just the appropriate size. Okay, next is how to restrain a mice. So when a mice, and I, this applies to any other laboratory animals or even animals, are accustomed to gentle handling or what they call as non-aversive handling, they will eventually accept a physical restraint without losing tameness towards the handler. So, um, well, after 
uh, picking up mice by Tana Orca, you should be able to restrain through uh, uh, the cover of your pants. So for full restraint, you have to place the mice on a surface that they can grip, hold the tail base securely, and then pull back gently to stimulate the animal to grip, and use the other hand to grab the loose skin at the back and the neck between thumb and forefingers. And in this way, the animal should be able to uh, be immobilized, but they can breathe easily. And this will be exactly the same as uh, um, restraining from cat. The graph below just shows uh, recent studies or studies in 2010 where they tried to compare different handling techniques, either by tail, tunnel, or cupping. And they tried to compare the voluntary interactions with handler before and after. And as you can see here, the scruff's restraint does not reverse taming by tunnel or cup handling. And that is shown by similar uh, levels of uh, the bar graph. However, when mice is picked up by tail, it reduced interaction after the scruff strain. How to restrain rats and laboratory rodents. So the principles to apply that we apply to mice generally applies to rats and other laboratory rodents. Picking up rats by tail is can be stressful for them and should be avoided. And so that's why there are um, techniques such as tunnel picking or tunnel handling and or cup handling, which gives them a which it, which would be better for them. So rats are usually habituated to handling and can normally be, be picked up easily by grasping them around the shoulder. And uh, by doing this as well, it is very important that habituating using a, uh, habituating the rats is very important for the handler not to be bitten because getting a bite from rat can really be very severe. And in the case of rodents, rodents have ta uh, the hair of rodents around the tail is usually uh, a sign of anti-predatory response. So for rodents, it's also important that we use a tunnel handling. And then whilst uh, in mice and rodents, it is important that uh, we use uh, habituation or it is important that they are handled by tunnel. In the case of marmoset, which is a non-human primate, marmosets do not like being picked up or handled in any way. And so uh, it is important that you either use uh, vanilla or nitrile gloves to be able to handle them. And you really have to be very gentle and have to handle them uh, with calmness and without any sudden movements. So there, it just what I just wanted to emphasize here is that for every species, there would be different methods for restraining them or handling them. But as I have said earlier, direct handling can be avoided, in, especially in the case of marmoset, and that is through positive reinforce, reinforcement uh, training. So these are, we're now talking about the best practices for animal transport. It, 
at some point in the establishment, animals will be transported either from uh, one establishment to another establishment, from room to rooms, or uh, even from places to places. And transport is, can be a significant stressor. Uh, the primary objective of those uh, involved in animal transport is for them to be able to move the animals in a manner that do not jeopardize their well-being and that their arrival, their, they should arrive safe in their destination in good health and with minimal distress. There are many aspects of transport process that needed to be considered and that includes the route and journey plan, container design, vehicle design, competence and altitude of the driver, attitude of the drivers and the others involved in transportation. Of course, the travel dura duration, the nature of food and water supplies and arrangements for acclimatization after transport. So there are already set legislations or minimum standards for the welfare of animals during transport. And these regulations apply to the transport of all living vertebrate animals for the purpose of uh, uh, regulated procedures. Next is training. Um, there are several ways where we can train animals, but I just want to focus on positive reinforcement training, which would be very advantageous, especially in laboratory experiments. So positive training method is where uh, a reward is a desi reward desired behavior and which where it becomes a valuable tool for humane care and use of laboratory animals. So animals are given positive rewards in response to the performance of a certain des desired behavior. And this has uh, been based on, this has been shown as a refinement in an animal handling methods which has shown significant improvements in animal welfare, animal husbandry, veterinary care, and value of animals as research subjects. So uh, positive reinforcement training has been most uh, fully has been most fully developed and evaluated for laboratory primates as well and had similar advances that are being accomplished in many other animals. In the photo here, as you can see, these are just on top is a pig that has been trained to follow a moving target and then later is able to voluntarily climb the scale for routine uh, weighing. The photo at the bottom is a primate that is trained to follow a target that can be requested to seat on weighing scale in home cages, thereby, thereby um, avoiding capture, restraint, and removal from cages, which can be very stressful. Uh, tickling rats. So tickling rats is uh, a method that is being uh, done now has been well studied and it's sort of a ex very good example of social enrichment. It is increasing, becoming increasingly recognized as an effective means to improving rat welfare because it mainly mimics the natural play habits of rats. So when tickling rats is used before, uh, or the tickling of rats can be used before a very stressful procedures such as dosing or blood sampling. And 
By using this, it has been shown to reduce the impact of the procedure that is being uh, done. So here, to tickle a rat, you have to have a dorsal contact and a flip and a pin. Um, this has been well studied, as I have said, and so you can see from the graphs at the side that separate experiments have shown benefits of tickling and that, I, that it has been re reported as an effective means of improving welfare and reducing anxiety in rats. But that is also for both handlers and the new environment. As you can see here, the green line, um, the green uh, area is a positive effect and the gray one is non and negative. So you can see in vocalization, approach and anxiety, the green has a definitely a significant proportion. Um, using tickling it has also shown biochemical alterations, such as an increase in hormone, which is uh, dopamine, and it has been shown to upregulate genes that have been associated in feeding and metabolism. So tickling of rats is actually associated to humans following laughter and it's been uh, used as a as a spec to speculate whether tickling could be used as a means to identify biomarkers for, for positive affective states. A pain assessment. So pain can actually be assessed behaviorally or facially. Um, it is in the Animal Welfare Act that we should minimize pain and distress, but sometimes uh, pain can be uh, uh, pain can be an effect of a, a regulated precision, and it can also be inevitable. Previously, a lot of our ways to assess pain is behaviorally, and it's through writhing or twitching or back arching. So here in the first uh, figure, you can see that there's a muscular contraction causing the concavity of the flank, and that is writhing. And writhing and twitching can be happening at the same time, and twitching is a spasmodic movement of the fur, usually at the back of the rib. The next photo is uh, an example of back arching, where there is a stretching of uh, forelegs and hind legs, causing the abdomen of the rat to be raised from the cage floor and back to be arched. But interestingly, I have also found that uh, pain can be assessed facially. So uh, a professor in, I think in Liverpool, has been trying to study changes in facial expression that can be associated to assessment of pain. And this has been called as a grimace or grimace scale. This has now been uh, evaluated in mice, uh, rats, and in rabbits. So I'm just showing you a few things, but actually uh, the grimace scale for these three animals includes um, uh, from the orbital, nose, cheeks, and also the jawline. So the, the effective uh, alleviation of pain in the laboratory animals depends on the ability to recognize pain and assess its severity. So as I've said, the traditional methods of pain assessment is based on monitoring behavior and clinical signs. But uh, Professor Mojil was able to demonstrate that changes in facial expression can also provide a reliable and rapid means of assessing pain in mats, rice, uh, rats, and rodents. 
And um, th for example, they try to look at narrowing of the eyes or orbital tightening here. So as you can see, the first uh, scale is zero and the highest scale is two where orbital tightening is obviously present. And that is a little bit uh, the same between mouse and rabbit. Um, it is important that when using the facial uh, scale that you do this uh, quickly because uh, the observation for var the, I think the observation for variation uh, can be avoided. And also it is important that they should be uh, graded when the animals are awake. So I have talked about uh, some local uh, procedures or activities in the lab, and now I'm going to euthanasia or killing protected animals. As I have said yesterday, killing in the UK is actually as a, defined as a schedule one protocol. And there are killing methods that have been laid for specific types of animals. But it's important that when you kill uh, a protected animal, you should be able to confirm uh, permanent cessation of circulation, uh, destruction of brain, dislocation of neck, exsanguination, confirmation of onset of rigor mortis, instantaneous destruction of a body in a macerator. So these are ways to define that a protected animal has been killed. So the methods for animals other than fetal, larval, or uh, em embryonic forms are varied. So we either use a, an overdose of anesthetics using a, a this is quite for all animals, but for exposure of carbon dioxide gas, this is only for birds and rodents, which weighs uh, 1.5 kilograms and below. For uh, dislocation of neck, this should be applicable to rodents up to 500 grams, rabbits for one kilo and birds for one kilo. And so, and concussion of concussion of brain by striking the cranium. Uh, this is for rodents and rabbits for up to one kilo, birds for up to 250 grams, and some amphibians and reptiles for up to one kilo, and for some fishes as well. And the captive bull and electrical stunning for ungulates. But the last one is only for um, uh, people who are are skilled to do this. There are methods for protected animal at the fetal, larval, or embryonic form. And this includes uh, overdose again of anesthetics for all animals. In the case of birds and reptiles, they are either refrigerated, uh, disruption of membranes or maceration in the apparatus approved under appropriate slaughter legislation, exposure of carbon dioxide in near 100% concentration until they're dead. For mice, rats, and rabbits, uh, there's a cooling of fetus followed by immersion in cold tissue fixative. And decapitation for mammals and birds for up to 50 grams. Um, uh, one of the questions yesterday was, uh, what do we do and uh, how do we dispose uh, the dead animals in the lab. So one of the procedures in the animal welfare is to first ensure they're dead and second, once this has been insured, they should be incinerated. So lastly, I think what I have been uh, sharing to you are all about refinement. And really the core message is that 
when we align our experiments to the 3R, it drives better science and it improves animal welfare. And as I've been going through the literatures of the different ways to improve refinement programs, um, it is clear to me that a lot of scientists have been trying to exploit different technologies to improve uh, the understanding and of the impact of the animal welfare and scientific outcomes. And I thought all of the procedures has become, is evolving and they have all been advancing. So I just have here a photo of a monkey restraining chair. And I don't think this has already been, I'm not sure if this has already been uh, used widely, but it's under review. And this way of restraint to animal seem to have shown reduced uh, stress and discomfort to a minimum and can ultimately facilitate good performance for monkeys and good quality scientific data. So with that, I would like to thank you again for listening and I am happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hosmilio, for the day two presentation. So that ends our learning session on the bioethics on animal handling and research. So I saw what our esteemed speaker said. She is now accepting questions. And I have a few already in my list. Uh, there were uh, a few questions already that we captured via Zoom. So uh, Dr. Hosmilio... Uh, let me take this opportunity to read you the first question from Josefino Castillo uh, via Zoom. Uh, his question is, um, RA8485 Section 6 declares it lawful when the animal is killed after it has been used in authorized research or experiments. Can the term authorized mean a component of a laboratory class experiment? We have been using frogs, rabbits, and cats in zoology laboratory classes since time immemorial. Is it still allowed? So I've said yesterday that every country has their own local and national ethical rules. I think if that is the one applying to the Philippines, and then that should be the authorized word, should be legally compliant. Yeah, um, so that should be possible. Yes, okay possible pa rin. So that uh, is the question from uh, Josefino Castillo. So next question po. Uh, again from Josefino Castillo via Zoom. Uh, he said that we are doing research that needs blood samples from our mice. What would be the best way to extract blood? Retroorbital or tail vein bleeding? How much blood am I allowed to extract? <laughs> Um, I personally have not collected blood from mice for a long time. However, um, a lot of the recommendations is try to prevent retroorbital because it causes stress. Um, it is now, as part of the refinement program, scientists are being encouraged to use microsampling. And microsampling is where you use uh, blood that is just below 50 microliters which will also be very significant in the uh, experimental studies. So I don't think um, collecting blood is one of another, uh, is another stressful uh, procedure. Taking the minimum amount of blood that is needed is quite important. I think it is important to look at micro blood sampling and that will help uh, to reduce or minimize stress of the animals. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Myra. We have another uh, particularly interesting question here uh, from Joshua Bakunador via Zoom. His question is, are there any standard protocols or procedures in handling aquatic organisms such as invertebrates and fishes? Yeah, there are actually. So while well, I was trying to prepare the presentation, I was trying to look at how diverse I would, I would, would I go? But I have found wildlife, I have found fishes, but a lot of uh, the focus on fish that I have seen is more on zebrafish because zebrafish is well used as an animal model for studying humans. I know for a fact that the Philipp 
we have we're very have very rich fishery resources and so we are able to study a lot of that um but definitely there are regulations for fishes okay thank you for that so we have here a first question from facebook it's from kiko santos so uh, to our participants in Facebook, you are also free to ask your questions. Just comment them in and we will read it to our speaker. So here's his question. Uh, may I please clarify if there is a local regulation from the Department of Agriculture on the ethical use of laboratory animals and, certain, and if certain fines are imposed for those who do not comply? Yes, there is. I have read that yesterday from, so I have a, so it's very easily downloadable. You don't need, so the, the RA8489 of the Philippines stipulates the, not, the rules for non-compliance, the fines for non-compliance. My only criticism is I thought that the fines are quite small. And so I think it will not really drive uh, institutions to uh, enforce the proper rules just because it's very easy just to let go of not doing it properly. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure. Um, as long as you want, I think at the end of the day, what is important is you want to have a good result and a quality um, scientific data. And if that's the aim of the experiment, you will definitely would want to uh, gain the maximum uh, um, advantages for from your animal work. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So we have here another question. It might be related to the question on uh, extraction of blood. Uh, this question is from Joel Sabeliano. Uh, his question is, is there any instruments that can be, are there any instruments that can be used for micro sampling? Um, no, actually. So the micro sampling is just from, I think what I've read is uh, using the tail. Uh, so there are no experiment, uh, no instrument. The only instrument that is required is uh, the one to use for his training to be able to extend the tail and collect. Other than that, I have not seen anything, but I can loop it further and then I can send it. Okay, ma'am. We have uh, another question from Christian Condes via Zoom as well. Um, I have read studies where the cardioprotective and hepatoprotective activity of drugs were tested on white mice. Animals were sacrificed and their heart and liver were obtained to conduct histopathological analysis. My question would be, do you know how hard it is to get IACUC approval for this kind of experiment? I do not know. I know the experiment is... Um involve uh, something like a category that would be severe and can be classified as severe and so if it's uh, that then you might have a difficulty to be able to justify the benefit or the gain from those type of experiment but I unfortunately I do not have any idea I'm so sorry. Okay, that's okay, ma'am. Okay, we have another question here um, from Rodrigo Calillon, by Inyo, from Facebook. Does the state university, uh, do state universities need to apply for institutional license before someone from the faculty of the university can conduct experiments using non-human animals, or animals, rather? Well, definitely. Um when I said yesterday about the establishment of license, that may include an individual, a pharmaceutical company, a university, and a research institute. So definitely a, a research institute or a university should have, uh, should apply and should have all their protocols in place as well. Okay, noted for. And we have another question from Lyle Christian Santiago. Uh, his question is, are protocol on scientific laboratory same with commercially related lab in relation to proper animal handling, just like those company who does animal testing on their product? Yeah, that is crazy. But 
um, I believe the pharmaceutical company is also an establishment that should follow uh, all the rules that is stated in an establishment license. So if that's the case, the, the rules that is being followed by pharmaceutical companies and the university should be all aligned. If that is not happening, there should be another team looking for about the compliance. But it is expected that both of them should have should follow the same protocol. Otherwise, the results in the company and the results in the university would be totally different, and they should also be aligned if we're trying to develop drugs and vaccines. Okay, thank you, Paul. Okay, we have here a question. So it's a pretty gruesome question. <laughs> With which sacrifice or killing method for mice would you recommend? CO2 inhalation or cervical dislocation? That's a question from Josefino Castillo via Zoom. I have done both. So in Korea, we have always done it using cervical dislocation. Oh, no, sorry. And sometimes in uh, sorry, in cranial dislocation, but in Cambridge, the regulations of the university is mainly on CO2. Um, I think it is better to do a CO2. And yesterday I've said about uh, the having the ability to be able to see or identify an animal that is nearly dying or have the signs of nearly dying. If you're using a CO2 uh, uh, inhalation or uh, you should be able to, uh, maybe there are uh, the right timing for you to be able to do the process. So for me, maybe a personal choice would be the use of CO2. Okay, so the use of CO2, that's the preference of our speaker. I hope that answers the question of uh, Mr. Castillo. Okay, we have um, a few questions left here. So if you have uh, a few last questions, please um, key in it via Zoom or Facebook now so that our speaker can answer. Okay, so our next uh, question. Do we have specific guidelines on how to handle farm animals? Uh, such as poultry and livestock, as we usually use them in feeding trials? Yeah, so for the feeding trials, yesterday I have said that there are non-regulated procedures, and this would include feeding trials, I think. Um, but I've got a guidelines, I was able to see a guidelines for farm animals as well. And there will be another speaker who will be talking on avian, uh, bioethics and avian. So I'll leave that to him if that's okay. Okay. Okay, so we have another question here about uh, different, different species naman po. Uh, is there any ethical regulation in using pests or invasive animals in general as research subjects? Example, Norway rats, insects such as cockroaches and cane, um, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, the question is from Dante Panalangin from Facebook. Um, his question is, is there any ethical regulation in using pests or invasive animals in general as research subjects? Example is uh, Norway rats, insects such as cockroaches and cane toads. Okay, so in the case of using vertebrates, even if they are pests, uh, they should be under the regulation of Animal Welfare Act. In the case of invertebrates, such as insects, I, when I, when I read the Animal Welfare Act of the Philippines, the living animal is still defined for vertebrates, so maybe it is not regulated in our country, but in countries where it includes uh, invertebrates, although in the, U the UK, I found that the definition of invertebrates only includes butterflies, I'm not certain if insects would be included, but they should be included because they are vertebrates. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is uh, well noted. 
Okay, we have um, our one uh, final question for this session. So for those uh, questions who didn't make it, we will send in your questions to Dr. Husmilio's email. She will be very happy to answer uh, everyone's questions. So again, uh, just a reminder for everyone, don't forget to answer our evaluation form that we will show later on. Okay, so let's move on to the last question for this afternoon. The question is from Natalie Benigno via Zoom. Good afternoon, ma'am. You discussed handling procedures mainly for small terrestrial vertebrates. Are there any protocols for handling larger marine vertebrates such as turtles? Um, turtles are reptiles, so there should be. Um, the literature that I have did not include turtles, so that's why I did not really add it. And also, I thought there is another presenter that will handle more of anim wildlife animals. But there are. The answer is there are. Uh, what I can do is um, the references that I've got are really comes in manuals and in booths. So, and I have in my presentation at the very last, actually, I have added the references for uh, animal handling and restraints. So if you get a copy of the presentation, all the references, and I, I can include the reptiles and the fish as well uh, for your use later on. So that won't be a problem. Okay, that ends our uh, question and answer portion for the second uh, session of our uh, Bioethics on Animals uh, webinar. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Myra for uh, sharing your um, expertise to our speakers, I, I mean to our participants this afternoon. Thank you very much. Can I get a virtual round of applause for Dr. Myra? Uh, Zoom participants, can I get a virtual round of applause naman dyan? Okay, thank you very much again, Dr. Myra. So at this point, um, we will present to you uh, the Certificate of Appreciation from uh, the Department of Industrial Technology Development Institute. And I would like to call uh, our director who is uh, with us uh, at the, uh, the, all the parts of the presentation. Uh, he was, she was also here with us uh, yesterday and now this afternoon. So um, may I call on Dr. Annabel B. B. Briones to uh, read the certificate of appreciation to be given to our esteemed speaker this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And once again, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Myra for a very... Uh, a wonderful <laughs> presentation lecture no? and it's very uh we call this a, a good uh, uh knowledge for us for for handling animals so with that uh, the industrial technology development institute of the department of science and technology uh presents this uh, Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Myra P. Husmilio, Balik Scientist, University of Cam Cambridge, for sharing her expertise as resource person for the webinar entitled Bioethics of the Use of Animals in Research, Proper Animal Handling, as part of the establishment of the Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines, program of the Department of Science and Technology, held online on July 8 and 9, 2021 via Zoom, given this the uh, ninth day of July, 2021. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayra Tios Mayu. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for Dr. Annabel V. Briones for presenting uh, the Certificate of Appreciation to our speaker. So just uh, wait po, before natin i-release ang ating uh, evaluation form. So uh, again, kailangan nyo pong ma-accomplish ito para po ma-receive nyo ang inyong certificates and yung presentation po ni Doc Mayra. So before we um, wrap up this presentation, may I please call on uh, the Chief of the Environment and Biotechnology Division to give us the closing remarks for the first installment of our webinar series for the Virology Institute. Good afternoon, Sir Ray. Good afternoon, Meg, and good afternoon, Dr. Myra. 
It's finally <laughs> nice to see you in person. <laughs> Kasi uh, nakita ko lang po kayo sa mga reports ng aking mga office mates and uh, on uh, <laughs> Uh, and yung mga, and very nice photo on the poster that was created by one of our staff. Again, th- thank you for your unselfish sharing of your expertise in the field of uh, this bioethics on the use of animals for research. But more importantly, thank you for volunteering to be part of the Balik Scientist uh, program uh, that would really be backbone of our uh, Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines uh, And of course, I'd like to thank the participants who in less than three hours napuno yung aming slot. <laughs> so we were, but of course, we also have to thank yung ating mga participants on uh, on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. So I'm sure they'd be excited to to look at this series which would last until April 2022. And uh, thank you also to our colleagues from uh, TSD, uh, that's the Technological Services Division and the uh, our MIS group who painstakingly uh, helped us a very, in a very, very short time to come up with this uh, very great uh, program. And of course, our VIP team led by our director, Dr. Annabel Libriones, and uh, one person from CED, who's always, who had been coordinating with all our Balik scientists, si Maricar, and all the other members of VIP team who are under our division, the Environment and Biotechnology Division. So uh, again, please watch out for the series. I think next, uh, we'll see more of uh, Doc Myra. I think towards the last month, uh, last week of August, yata, we're still arranging for the exact date. So we'll see again Dr. Rosemary for that. So again, thank you. And hopefully to see everyone at Kapas Tarlac when we set up our Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines facility. Magandang hapon po sa lahat at mag-ingat na lang po tayo. Salamat po. Take it away, Meg. Okay, thank you very much, Sir Ray. So, uh, as what uh, Engineer Isgera said, this is just the first of the many installments of the uh, Virology and Vaccine Institute of the Philippines uh, webinar series. Of course, this is an information and education campaign, of course, for you to know more about uh, the topics under this um under virology and uh, vaccines in the country. So again, thank you very much po sa ating Buena Mano for this webinar series, Dr. Myra T. Hosmilio for um, gracing our webinar series for this afternoon, most especially. Again, uh, good morning po sa inyo dyan sa UK. And um, for our participants to uh, from Facebook, Zoom, and YouTube, thank you very much for your active participation. And of course, sa mga nagbigay po ng questions. Again, uh, those who sent in questions that we're not able to uh, be addressed today uh, will be sent to Dr. Myra's uh, email and she will answer all of them. So, um, i-flash na po natin ang evaluation form so that everyone can answer. So, there's a QR code or you can go to tinyurl.com slash bioethics evaluation. So, just a reminder, this link will be available for 24 hours only. So, you have to answer this in order to secure your certificates and the presentation of our speaker. So, once again, Uh, I am Megat Yenza from uh, DOST IPDI and it is my pleasure to uh, start off the first installment of our webinar series on the VVIP. Again, uh, thank you very much Dr. Myra and to our participants and sa ngalan po ng ating director Dr. Annabel Vibriones and our um, Deputy Director for Research and Development uh, Dr. Christine Marie C. Montesa. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Goodbye everyone. Thank you, Dr. Myra. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Mai. Uh, my pleasure, Paul. Bye, bye. Paul. See you. Laot na ang manok, hudyat na ng pagpasok. Paglilingkod na walang kapalit sa bayan ng aming hati. Tara na, kaibigan, 
Mahirap man ay kakayanin Sa pinagsamang lakas at galing Tagumpay ay mararating Tara na Recording stopped Huwag kang magpaiwan Gamitin ang dunong bansa ay susulong At ikabutin ang pangarap iwan Sa pamamagitan na Ating abutin ang pangarap niwan 